Before we dive in tonight, uh, I just wanted to remind you that there are free copies of this. In fact, most of them have been picked up, but I do think there's still some copies out there. Uh, this is a little Advent devotional. Uh, it just has about a page, I mean, really this much per day uh, in an entry. And I have really been blessed by it. And it's been, it's been really helpful to me just to take some time uh, every day and just kind of focus my mind and my, my heart around this season of Advent. Um, you know, Somebody asked me recently, what, what does Advent mean? And it, it means arrival or coming. And for us, we celebrate the season of Advent uh, because we're waiting. Uh, we are anticipating the birth of Christ, but really we're anticipating the return of Christ. And uh, it is just fascinating to me that as we get to this time of year and we get into the hustle and bustle of the holiday season, um, a lot of times the New Year's reflections come early for me. I don't normally wait until New Year's Day or even the, the week of New Year's to begin to think about the year and goals and, and things I did this year and highlights and all those kinds of things. Uh, they usually start around this time. And the really interesting thing is that uh, as I've been walking through this uh, Advent devotional, as I've been thinking a lot just about, about the birth of Christ, I have been fi- I've found myself really uh, intently focused on God's plan. Uh, God's plan for my life, God's plan for our church. And then uh, jo- Joanne and Mike had been out of town uh, last week, and, and when she got back yesterday, uh, she, she turned around and handed me a file full of uh, all kinds of different kinds of entries and a timeline about Cornerstone's history. And I sat there today and I spent a couple hours reading through that file and just marveling at what God has done here at Cornerstone. This church is uh, 37 years old. We're coming up on our 40th birthday as a church. And it's amazing. It started with a handful of people over there at the Marriott. And because of God's plan, because of God's grace. He's taken this church and he has multiplied it. Out of this church we've seen salvations, we have seen lives absolutely impacted, we've seen disciples made and people raised up and sent out into ministry, into the mission field, and I'm grateful to God. Grateful to God for all that he has done here at Cornerstone and honestly I can't wait to, uh, to see what God is going to do here in the future. And so as we were getting started tonight I just wanted to encourage you uh, I don't think that there's a a better way to warm your heart during the month of December than to spend time reading and thinking about what what the Scripture teaches us about the coming of Jesus. So, I just want to plug that for you one more time. It's not too late to pick this up. You're not going to be behind. If you didn't start at the beginning, you can just start where we are tomorrow. Is that all that's on the table? Is that it? They're on the tables. Yes, everything that we have is out there. So, So, get it. Get it before it's gone. (laughs) Down in, uh, in the comments too. Bowling Alley. Bowling Alley. Bowling yep. So tonight we have two more weeks uh, in this series we've been doing on foundations of the Christian life. And so tonight uh, we're going to answer a question that you hopefully have known the answer to for a long time. What is salvation? And uh, just as a reminder, uh, this is m- there are 20 different doctrines that are covered in this Christian beliefs book. I have more or less followed it. I have combined some and I've chosen a couple others that are not uh, explicitly covered in the book. But this, this is a really, really helpful resource. And it's written so that you can uh, read it, understand it, and keep up with it. But tonight, we're going to talk about this, what, this idea of what is salvation. And uh, a lot of times, we will start with a quote. So here's a quote from Jonathan Edwards, who is maybe the most brilliant theological mind that America has ever produced. He said, you contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. I really like that quote because it clarifies everything. When we look at the cross, in my mind, I've I've told you this before, but in my mind, I imagine the cross as being like 100 feet tall. And then I think about my righteousness, the good things that I've done in my life, what I would offer to God. And I think about it as though me trying to save myself, me trying to say, God, you should accept me because of these things that I've done. You should love me because of these things that I've done. I think about taking that little bit of stuff and putting it next to that cross and saying, you know, Jesus did most of it. Jesus did most of the work to save me. And, but here's what I did. That's not how it works. We contribute nothing to our salvation except the sin, which is why we need it. But thank God that Jesus did everything necessary to save us. He did everything necessary to save us. And He wipes away our sin totally and completely. So let's talk about how that works. So I call this the parking lot test. 
a lot of times uh, when there are when, when I'm doing uh, conversations with new members or I'm just talking to a Christian and I'm trying to understand, uh, I'm trying to get a grasp of their understanding of salvation, I'll give them what I call the parking lot test. So here's the scenario. I'll say, let's say that you're here at Cornerstone one morning and we're in the middle of the worship service. doesn't matter which service you attend, whether you go to 9 or 1030. But let's say that we're in the middle of the worship service and you just notice that there's a person that you've never seen before standing at the end of your row. And all throughout the service, you just seem to, to notice a look on their face that says, man, they're, they're really paying attention. They, they are really locked in. And, uh, you know, dur during the worship, they're just kind of looking around, but you could tell they like it, but they don't know what to do with it. And then during the sermon, they're clearly listening. And uh, it's almost like you can sense the conviction that they feel. And, uh, and then the service wraps up and you make your way to your car. And as you get to your car, uh, right before you open your door and get in, you, you see, hey, that person's parked right next to me. And here they are standing here. And they look at you and say, that was really something. And you say, sure it was. It always is. And they said, what do I have to do to have that? What do I have to do to become a Christian? Well, all the setup has been done. They've this been gift wrapped for you. Evangelism doesn't get easier than this. So now we're here in the parking lot. What do you say to that person? They said, how do I become a Christian? What are the next words that come out of your mouth? Or what is the, what is the, the thing that you want to make sure to say? If you can't communicate, you know, however you attack it, what are, what are the key things that you want to tell that person? So I call that the parking lot test. And when I listen to people answer that question, uh, I'm really only listening to, to see if they can get to two words. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. Because when we look at the Scriptures and we talk about salvation... The moment of salvation is really based on that. It is when you look at Jesus who died the death that you deserved on the cross in your place, do you see him as the one that saves you? And do you know that the reason that he died on a cross in your place was because of your sin? So for me, repent and believe are really not two different things. It's really one thing. Because if you turn to Jesus, you're turning to the one who took away your sin. And you can't hang on to your sin and hang on to Jesus. So what we want to tell people when they say, what must I do to be saved? We want to say, repent and believe. Walk away from the sin that made your salvation necessary and cling with everything you are to the Jesus that saved you, to the one who wiped away your sin. That's the parking lot test. Repent and believe. And the New Testament expresses these ideas in so many different ways. Uh, one of the things I said on Sunday in Starting Point is there's no wrong way to eat a Reese's. There's no wrong way to tell people about salvation. You can attack it so many different ways. The New Testament does. But it always comes back to these ideas. What we are being saved from is our sin. Jesus is the one that saved us. So believe in Him with all of your heart and turn from your sin so that you can turn toward Christ. Now, the magic words are found in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. That whosoever believes in Him, believes, faith, repent, and believe, whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I'd quote Acts 2, 37 38, but I don't have it memorized. So could somebody look that up for us? And then would somebody look up Mark 1, 15 for us? And then as soon as we have them, we'll talk about it. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, Peter has given this really amazing sermon at Pentecost. Crazy things have happened. The Holy Spirit has come down. There was flaming tongues of fire. Peter stands up in the midst of this crowd with all of these people speaking a bunch of different languages that were all in town for this religious festival. And he begins to preach the gospel to them. And it says that they are cut to the heart. They just, they're overwhelmed. They're your person in the parking lot that they are just asking, what must I do to be saved? In fact, they said to Peter, brother, what shall we do? And he said, repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, he's not telling them that baptism is the thing that forgives your sins. He's saying, repent, like believe in Jesus, turn away from your sin, turn toward Jesus and show the world that you have done that by being baptized. Identify yourself with Jesus. That's why when we put people under the water, we say buried, 
in the likeness of His death and raised to walk in the newness of life. You are identifying yourself with Jesus and the act that He did to save you from your sins. So Peter tells these brothers, repent in the name or believe in the name of the Lord Jesus. And speaking of Jesus, would somebody read Mark 1.15 for us? And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Amen. So, I, I was explaining, um, I'm trying to remember where I did this. I was in this room. It must have been on Sunday at starting point. Uh, I was explaining to them that if Jesus were here in this room with us, if, if we could, you know, if he just showed up and then he said, hey, let's do some Q&A, and you could ask him whatever you wanted to. If you asked Jesus, like if you, if you held up your Bible and said, Jesus, I, I've read the Bible, and really you show up in the New Testament and the Gospels, and I've read every word you said. In fact, I've got a red letter Bible, and I've paid attention to every word that came out of your mouth when you walked on this earth at least the ones that are recorded for us. But I got a question. And if you could ask Jesus this question. Jesus, what was the most important thing you talked about? Not what do we think the most important thing, but if you could ask Jesus, hey, what was it all about? What was the thing, the most important thing that you told us about? You know what he would say? He would say the kingdom of God. Without a doubt, he would say the kingdom of God. He starts off saying, repent, repent, and believe the good news. But before that, he says, Behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe is not our idea. It's Jesus' idea. And what he's talking about when he says the kingdom of God is he's saying, Let me explain to you what salvation is. Because I'm, a lot of people think that it's about making sure that you don't go to hell. And that's not at all what salvation is about. Now, the good news is that you don't go to hell if you believe in Jesus. But that's not why Jesus came. He didn't come just to keep us out of hell. In fact, He came so that we could have the life that we were always supposed to have. He came because God put people on this planet, people that He loved, that He stamped His image on, that He made in His image and likeness. But we messed it all up. And because we did, we took this beautiful creation that God had made and we set it totally in the wrong direction. The whole creation itself, everything that God has made has been marred by human's sin. That is how devastating and deep the consequences of sin are. And that is why Jesus was the only person that could undo what was broken and lost at the fall. And so Jesus comes preaching about the kingdom of God because what he is saying is God's rule, God's reign. You know, the one that exists in heaven perfectly. Like right now in heaven, everything happens in heaven the way that God wants it to. It's always perfect. It's life the way it's supposed to be. But when we pray the Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 6, we say, I just did this in a preschool chapel yesterday morning, we say, Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth like it is in heaven. So Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God to earth. He came to make the earth like heaven. Because that's the image that we see at the end of the Bible is where heaven and earth finally become one place. Where God's presence is with His people in the place that He has created. John looks up and he says, I saw the new heavens and the new earth descending down from the sky. And so Jesus says, I came so that my reign will be realized on the earth. And He says, it starts off like a mustard seed. It's so small. It's almost imperceptible. But it grows and it grows and it grows. It's like leaven in bread. And when you think about that, it started with Jesus and 12 disciples and then 70 and then Pentecost happens. And now you have a few thousand and then you have tens of thousands. And now the gospel is spread all over the world. And more than a billion people today claim the name of Christ just who are alive today. And there are more Christians on the earth right now than at any time in history. What Jesus did when he said he brought the kingdom to earth, he brought the kingdom to work to be successful. And it has been. And it is growing and it's growing. And at the very start of that, Jesus says, how do you get in on this? How do you become a part of what I came to do in bringing God's kingdom, God's reign and rule to earth? He says, you repent and believe. Turn away from your sin and turn toward me, God's Messiah, God's Son, God's King. Because the kingdom belongs to me. The glory, the dominion belongs to me. But you can be a part of it if you will repent and believe. So that's how we know that those are the words that we are looking for when we're trying to share the gospel with someone. So let's talk about salvation. 
you, you may not have realized this before, but your, your Bibles talk about salvation in what I call three tenses. And sometimes understanding this can really help unlock the Bible for you because you'll notice that it talks about salvation in different ways. And if you have these categories to drop those scriptures into, it will help you make much more sense of the scriptures as we encounter them. So there's three kinds. Uh, and to help you understand, we'll call them past, present, and future. Past is justification. I am saved from the penalty of sin. Now that's assuming somebody's already a Christian. Now for a non-believer, this wouldn't be true. But if you're in this room and you're trusting in Jesus, you've already been justified. You have already been saved from the penalty of sin because Jesus' death on the cross, in your place, counts for you. And God has forgiven you of all of your sin. Present tense, sanctification. If you're here in this room and you're trusting in Jesus, this is what's happening to you right now. You are being saved from the power of sin. Hopefully, over time, as you grow in your faith, sin is losing its grip on you. You are becoming more and more like Jesus, which is what is promised to us in Romans 8. It says that the Holy Spirit in us, if we're trusting in Jesus, is conforming us. It is working right now to hammer and chisel and make you into the image of Jesus. So we are being saved from the power of sin. And then in the future, that's called glorification. That's when you will be saved from the presence of sin because you will be physically present with Jesus forever and sin will be no more. It will no longer have a hold on you. It will no longer affect you. It will no longer be in your presence. So those are the three tenses of salvation. Justification, I am saved from the penalty of sin. Sanctification, I am currently being saved right now from the power of sin. Glorification, I will be saved fully, finally, forever from the presence of sin. So let's talk about justification for a few minutes. I am saved from the penalty of sin. This is what Wayne Grudem says, and I think this is very helpful. He says, justification is an instantaneous legal act of God in which he, one, thinks of our sins as forgiven and thinks of Christ's righteousness as belonging to us, and therefore, two, declares us to be just or morally righteous in his sight. Justification is what God does in response to our belief in the gospel. Now, the most helpful way to think about this is to start off by asking, what does it mean to be justified? What is justification? Well, to be justified means to be declared righteous. What's the opposite of righteous? Unrighteous or guilty. We are all guilty of sin. Every person in this room, every person that I've ever met, every person that you'll ever meet is under the weight of the curse. You are in a world filled with sin and you are a sinner by nature and by choice. And so all of us are guilty of sin. And because our God is holy and perfect and righteous, as we've talked about several weeks ago, He can't be in the presence of sin. And because He is holy and righteous and just, He can't just pretend like your sin doesn't matter. Because it does matter. It was an awful offense against a holy God who is not only holy and perfect, but eternal. So God comes up with this way, the only way, to save us from our sins and sending His Son, Jesus, to die the death that we deserve in our place and bear the penalty of our sins. And so, justification is when God looks at you and He declares that you are righteous. You are not guilty because Jesus has died your death in your place. Jesus has bore the penalty for your sin. So you are no longer guilty. You are righteous. You are, no longer you are no longer unworthy. You are worthy. You are righteous in God's sight because of Jesus. And justification is what God does in response to our belief in the gospel. So we'll try to explain that by looking at some verses. So Romans 3.26 tells us in this great passage uh, that God is the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In other words... Once you put your faith in Jesus, God, the, the just judge of the universe, of the earth, of the world, is the one who declares you to be not guilty. He declares you to be righteous. Romans 5.1 tells us how we are justified. And the answer is we are justified by faith. So it's not like God looks at us and says, you know, I was wrong. You were actually really great. You were doing a really good job and I just wasn't paying enough attention. But now that I am paying attention, I should have let you into heaven. No, it's not that at all. Instead, it is the fact that because of what Jesus did, God looks at you when you put your faith in Jesus. When you repent and believe, God looks at you and declares you to be righteous. We are justified by faith. 
Galatians 2.16 tells us that a person is not justified by works or works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. One of the things that is so striking to me is that the New Testament tells us over and over again that salvation is the free gift. But it is the free gift that we are always trying to buy. We try to earn our salvation all the time. We keep a scorecard in our minds. And we think that God loves us when we're good and that God's mad at us when we're bad. And the truth is, God loves you all the time because of Jesus. And that's the only reason that He's able to love you, to welcome you, to embrace you. But He does love you because of Jesus. He's able to love you because of Jesus. And He loves you so much, that's why He sent Jesus in the first place. To rescue you from sin and hell and death and the grave and to give you eternal life. So Romans 3.24 says that we are justified by His grace as a gift. That's why sometimes when we do evangelism, Pastor Jim was just praying about what we need is courage to go and share the gospel with our neighbors. And that's right, we need the courage to go across the street. But when you think about it, and this is really convicting to me, when you think about it, if you want to be an effective evangelist, if you want to live your life like a missionary, you actually have to believe that the thing that you are offering to those you are sharing the gospel with is better than anything they already have. Amen. You really do have to believe that you have something to give them that they desperately need. Now, they might not know they need it, but you better believe it. It's like being a salesman who doesn't believe in the product. You know, you can't be an effective missionary, an effective evangelist or soul winner if you haven't been transformed by the love of God. But if you have been transformed by the love of God, if you really are convinced that what you have in Christ is the best thing in the world, man, you won't stop talking about it. It won't be that difficult to work it into a conversation. I told you before, I used to have what I called the, the Jack Bauer rule. So I was obsessed with the TV show 24. I watched it all the time. And what I noticed after a while is that even in conversations with strangers, it, it would always come up. At some point, you know, if I talk to you for more than five minutes, I'm just going to pivot to, so do you watch 24? I, I can hear myself saying it now. Well, I realize that if I'm comfortable with you enough to bring up 24, I'm comfortable enough to bring up Jesus. And so I started to challenge myself. Like when I heard myself in a random conversation, start talking about 24, which just happened naturally because I watched it all the time. Well, then I would say, okay, how can I move this conversation to be about Jesus? And I tried not to do it in a super aggressive way that made people uncomfortable, but all of us, all of us can find ways to ask questions like, so do you go to church anywhere? Did you grow up going to church? What do you think about faith? There's always, there's all kinds of ways to create an open door. And you just have to look for them. Sometimes it can just be a conversation where somebody's sharing with you how hard things are. And you can just take the lead by saying, man, you know, I really feel that. I really feel the weight of things. Or sometimes I deal with anxiety or I feel like I have all these things to do. I've really been trying to pray about that. That will, that will open people's eyes. It will create an open door for people to be able, uh, receptive to what it is that you might want to share. But for us, in order to have the kind of courage and the kind of passion that we need to share the gospel, we actually have to believe that the gospel is worth sharing. So, uh, to be justified is more than to be declared not guilty. It is to be declared righteous in God's sight. Because here's the beautiful truth of justification. What it really means is that if you, when, if you have put your faith in Jesus, when God looks at you, He doesn't see your sin. He sees His Son. Because what has happened is that Jesus, the one who died your death in your place on the cross, when God looks at you, He looks right through Jesus. And Jesus' life, His perfect righteousness, covers over all of your sin. Not only that, but it is justification that removes our condemnation. Some of the people in our church really struggle with this. That inner voice inside of their head is always telling them that they're not good enough that they're unworthy or unlovable or they'll never measure up, that they'll always fall short. And Romans 8.1 tells us that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God doesn't look at you and see your sin. He sees His Son. God doesn't look at you and think you're unworthy. He thinks you are worthy and lovable and beautiful, desirable and capable. You are His workmanship, this creation that He has made. He's made you to be something. And He's called you to use your gifts and talents and relationships for His glory, to advance His kingdom, to grow His church. 
He's calling all of us to be a part of that. And so it's a lie of Satan that tells you that you're unworthy, that you're unlovable, that you're too far gone, that you've sinned too much or too badly, and that no one loves you or will forgive you. I was sharing with somebody the other day uh, who was just telling me how painful it is because their story contains so much brokenness. And some of it's their fault. And they feel really bad about the fact that they did these things that got them where they were. And I said, you know, one of the coolest things about our culture, and probably any culture, is that we really love redemption stories. We love redemption stories. The whole Bible is a redemption story. But redemption stories always start with brokenness. Salvation is about God fixing what was wrong. It's about Him taking you, who you, when you were His enemy, when you were unlovable and unworthy, God sent Jesus to rescue you, to save you, and to bring you into His family. Look at what it says in Titus chapter 3. It says, When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Why? Not because of the good stuff that we did, not because of the works done by us in righteousness, because we didn't have any of those, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Verse 7, So that, being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We are justified by His grace so that we can be His heirs. We are co-heirs with Christ. Jesus is God's Son. We are God's sons and daughters. We have been adopted into His family. We are co-heirs and will inherit eternal life because of what Jesus has done. It is a great salvation that we enjoy. God didn't just save us a little bit. He doesn't just throw us scraps. He has welcomed us into His family. The most powerful being and force in all of existence has looked at you and called you beloved. He has welcomed you in. And anybody can get in on this. There are so many people walking around who don't come to church, not because they don't think they need it, but because they don't think that God loves them. They don't think that they deserve it. And the truth is they don't deserve it. And God loves them anyway. And He wants them and He wants to welcome them. But who is going to tell them? Who is going to be the one that communicates that to them? That says to them, hey, I go to Cornerstone and I would love for you to come with me on Sunday. Love for you to come to Bible study with me on Wednesday. Or join me in my small group. Someone has to tell them. And if Jesus has changed your life, if He has given you something that you actually love and appreciate and recognize for the wonderful salvation that it is, it gets easier and easier to be the bold witness that Jesus is calling you to be. So, let's talk about sanctification for a moment. So, if justification is what happened to us in the past, if you're trusting in Jesus now, justification happened to you at the moment of your salvation. At the moment of your salvation, God looked at you and said, Righteous. Well, sanctification is everything that happens between that time and the time that you die. Sanctification is a process, or as Wayne Grudem says, it's a progressive work of both God and man that makes Christians more and more free from sin and more and more like Christ in their actual lives. Now, for your salvation, you don't contribute anything to it. Your justification, that's what Jesus did for you on the cross. When God calls you righteous, it's not because you were good. It's because Jesus was. But sanctification is a thing that we both do together. The Holy Spirit works in you, and you work with the Holy Spirit in order to be more and more like Jesus. Romans 6.18 tells us that we have been set free from sin. Well, kind of. We've been set free from the penalty of sin. We are being set free from the power of sin because I certainly haven't been totally set free from sin. I don't think any of you have been set free totally from sin, but you will be. Romans 6.11 says, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Well, just because you became a Christian, that doesn't mean sin stopped coming for you. It doesn't mean sin stopped pulling on you and trying to pull you into darkness. And we know that. What we also know, though, is we've been talking about evangelism this whole time. There are all these people around us who are watching our lives. They know that you identify yourself as a Christian, whether or not you have a fish on your bumper sticker or not. They know because they know you. And if Jesus is real in your life, and they know that you've identified yourself with Jesus, they are watching your life. They're trying to learn whether or not it's for real. 
whether or not Jesus really has changed you. He has made you into a new kind of person and taught you a new way to live. Is your life being shaped and, and is what, coming, uh, what is coming out of you, is it the fruit of the Spirit? Or is it something else? So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to consider yourself dead to sin? It means to look at all that stuff that you left behind when you chose to repent and believe and to refuse to go back to it. That stuff is dead to me. Paul said, Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. So we consider ourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. But we know we still struggle with sin. This is what John's whole point was when we walked through 1 John together. John said, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. One of the things that I have, I have shared multiple times is that you're not doing anybody any favors to pretend like you don't struggle with sin. It doesn't help Christians grow when they look at your life and you pretend like you're just walking on a higher spiritual plane than the rest of us. Now, we all strive for holiness. That is a good and godly thing. But we don't act like we're not sinful or like it's not difficult to make our way through this life. It is. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we confess our sins. We don't pretend like we don't have it. But we give that over to God. We say, God, don't let me go back there. Don't let me keep looking at that sin that I was held in, ca in captivity to, in bondage to. Set me free from that sin. We wage war against our sin. We fight against it. That's what it means to be sanctified. Paul said, brothers, I do not consider what I ha uh, that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul if I have a hero in the Scriptures outside of Jesus, it's the Apostle Paul. And his whole point was not that I've already done it. I'm not perfect. I'm not flawless. But I am committed. I'm not going to quit chasing after Jesus. I will count everything in my life as rubbish in order to be found in Christ. To join Him in glory. The Apostle Paul was 100% committed to chasing after Jesus with his whole life and being. And that's, that's what he's sharing here in Philippians chapter 3. Not that I've made it my own, but I forget what lies behind to strain for what lies ahead. And then, this is, if I was going to explain sanctification to people and I only had one passage or just a couple minutes, I would take them right here to Philippians chapter 2. Paul says in Philippians 2, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, listen to this, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So is sanctification up to us or is it up to God? Well, if you read that part, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, that sounds a lot like it's up to us. Work out your salvation. Figure it out. Read your Bible. Pray to God. Be a part of a church. Be faithful in evangelism. Be faithful to grow as a disciple. Be faithful to serve and imitate Jesus. See the fruit of the Spirit growing in your life. He says to them, work out your own salvation. In other words, strain forward for what lies ahead. But then he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Well, if you just read the last part, it's God who works in you to will and to work. That sounds like sanctification is up to Him. And the truth is, it's supposed to be like this. Sanctification is us saying, I want to be like Jesus more than anything. And it's the Holy Spirit saying, you're going to be like Jesus whether you like it or not. That's what happens. The Holy Spirit works in us to conform us into the image of Christ. But one of the things about the Holy Spirit is that He's always working to convict us. He's always working to reveal our sin to us. But one of the things I think is most gracious about our Heavenly Father, is that when we become Christians, He doesn't just strip away all the sinful things about us all at once. Because I think we would die. We're so sinful. There's so many things about us that have been marred by sin and distorted and, and changed by sin that God doesn't just strip it all away from us at once. In fact, usually what happens in my life anyway, and many of the Christians that I've talked to, uh, God will give me one thing and say, how would you feel about giving this to me? This thing, this one thing. How would you feel about giving this to me? And so, 
then in that moment I choose. Am I going to be obedient to what God's calling me to do? Am I going to try to sacrifice this sin that for some reason I like, I don't want to let go of? Am I going to be obedient and give this over to Him? Or am I going to cling to it and hold on to it? So the Holy Spirit will call and say, why don't you give this to me? And then the funny thing is, if you do that and you let it go, then He'll come and tap you on the shoulder again and say, how'd you feel about giving that to me? And He's just constantly working to strip these things out of our lives so that we can look a little bit more like Jesus. It's almost like cleaning a mirror. You know, you just start and then as you work your way down, eventually you, you see, you can see clearly. Well, that's what the Spirit is doing in you. He's cleaning you up. He is removing the sin from you piece by piece, piece and bit by bit. And the question is, are you cooperating with Him? Are you working with Him? Uh, one of the things I think that Presbyterians do really well, they, t- they talk about availing yourself of grace. So they say, listen, like the Holy Spirit does this work of sanctifying. We, we can't do it. But they talk about availing yourself of grace. Imagine if, uh, if, if grace is a train that is powered by the Holy Spirit, they're like, you don't have any control over the train, but you can put yourself in front of the tracks. You, you can be where the Holy Spirit is moving. Well, where's the Holy Spirit moving? Right here in God's Word. You can be in God's Word every day. You can be reading it. Be desperate for Him. Be looking for Him. Dig for gold. Don't just rake for leaves. Don't just read a verse and then close it. But look for God every day in the Scriptures, and you'll find Him there. You can spend time in prayer every day. Not just the quick, God bless me, my family, my meal. But you can pray and seek the Lord, and you'll find Him there. You can gather with His people, not just to go through the motions, but to open yourself up to let God move. As we sing together, as we pray together, as we greet one another, as we share our burdens. And the Holy Spirit will meet you here. You can act like Jesus and find a way to serve somebody else. And the Holy Spirit will meet you there. You can avail yourself of grace. You can work out your salvation with fear and trembling because you know where God is. You know how to connect with Him, how to grow in Him. And as you're doing that, God is working in you to fashion you and conform you and to make you into the image of His Son. Uh, I found this chart today. This is what sanctification looks like. I'm convinced. So, this is the moment when you become a Christian. And this is what it looks like as you're on your way there. It is not always up and to the right. But, over time, we are making our way to glory. You are fighting for it. The Spirit is fighting for you. And you will make your way there. That is what the Christian life looks like. And we inevitably grow through the means of grace. All right, so we're going to wrap up tonight with talking about glorification. And I'm not going to tell you a lot about this because we're going to spend some time next week talking about this theme. But ultimately, this final step, glorification, where we are saved forever from the presence of sin, it is the result of our salvation. It is the thing that we are straining ahead for. So one day, when you die and you are with Jesus in glory, you will never be in the presence of sin again. You will be fully and finally and forever delivered from sin. It won't pull at you anymore. It won't be in your presence anymore. You will be able to fully live a life that is pleasing to God. But we just finished this study in 1 Peter. And... 1 Peter over and over again talks about this, the glory that is to be revealed at the coming of Jesus Christ. And so at the very end of 1 Peter chapter 5, which is the end of the letter, he says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To Him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The God of all grace has called you to His eternal glory in Christ. That's what glorification is, is when you get there. It's when you get to the place where Jesus is. You get to have the life that you were always meant to have. Because Jesus, one day, when He returns, what He is going to do is establish His kingdom that will never end. And Christians have debated about how all that's going to play out, but the thing they've never debated is this essential truth. That when He returns again in glory to judge the living and the dead, His kingdom will never end. Never end. And you get to be a part of that forever. And everybody you share the gospel with gets to be a part of that forever. Paul said 
that I consider the sufferings of this present life, the pains of this present life, as but a light and momentary affliction. Paul, who was beaten and shipwrecked and snake bit, he was stoned. He was treated worse in a short time for his faith than all of us will, are likely to be treated in our entire lives on account of our faith. And he said, it's but a light and momentary affliction. He said, it is not worth comparing to the eternal weight of glory that awaits us in Christ Jesus. What is coming for you is so much better than anything you've ever experienced in this life. One of the things that I think that it, that it means to be a mature Christian is to understand how desirable heaven is. Heaven is better in every way to the things that we experience in this life. There is no good thing in this life that will be lacking in the life to come. Everything in heaven is perfect and desirable. It is life the way it's supposed to be. Life as it should be. And so the last thing I want to share with you about glorification is just take you back to the things Jesus said in the Beatitudes. So listen, listen to these. And he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? Because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Eventually, in heaven, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. All of these promises, these things I'm telling you about the end of the Bible, heaven and earth become the same place, Jesus' kingdom being established forever, this is what he's talking about in the Beatitudes. He said that the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That the meek shall inherit the earth. They certainly didn't inherit the earth when Jesus was alive. They don't have it now, but they will. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward, your glory, your glorification is great in heaven. For they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus in the Gospels, when he gives us these beatitudes, these things that we so quickly sometimes just blow past, what he is telling us, that's, those, are, those are not right now words. The first part are right now. The second part, those are eschatological promises. Those are in time promises. Those are the things that Jesus is coming to give you upon his return. For the meek, it is that they shall inherit the earth. For the poor in spirit, it's that they will have and possess the kingdom of heaven. He said that those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who are pure in heart shall see God. So the promise for you, the promise for me, is that if you're trusting in Jesus with all that you are, if you're working with the Spirit toward your sanctification, you are availing yourselves of grace and you are straining forward to what lies ahead, what lies ahead for you is glory. It is life with God in heaven forever, in this perfect place, life the way it's supposed to be. And it will never end. It will never fall short. It will never not meet your expectations. It is infinitely better than anything that you could experience in this life. And it lasts forever. So my encouragement to you is as you are reading your Bibles, sorry, I thought I had one. There it is. Uh, as you're reading your Bibles, you will bump into these salvation, these senses of salvation that are used in three tenses. Because sometimes it really does talk about it as if it's the future. That your salvation is filled with glory. Well, it is filled with glory, but most of that glory is still to come. Sometimes it talks about your salvation by saying that you have been justified by grace through faith. And you have. Because that's what happened the moment that you believed. And sometimes it is talking about working out your salvation with fear and trembling. And that's not because you're not saved. You are. You are already justified, but you are being sanctified by God's Spirit. As you walk through this life, He is giving you opportunities and moments to practice compassion, to show love and kindness, to serve, to know the living God and be changed by Him so that your heart and your mind, your soul, your body, your strength, every part of who you are 
can be made new. Because that is what the future looks like. One day we're all going to be made new. We have been made alive in Jesus today, but one day we shall totally be like Him. In resurrection bodies, we will live a life in glory, and we will experience every good thing that is a part of what Jesus came to bring us. We contribute nothing to our salvation except the sin that made it necessary. Jesus gives us salvation that is greater than we could possibly imagine. He did it by sacrificing Himself on the cross in our place. And because He did that, we are able to offer freely extend the gospel invitation to anybody who will listen. So the last thing I want to say tonight is uh, Sunday we're starting a three-week Christmas series. And we're looking at different parts of the hymn, Joy to the World. And I'm going to be walking through the scriptures, but this Sunday, the theme for that, for that sermon is let every heart prepare him room. And that is going to be just a, a purely evangelistic sermon. And so if there's a person in your life who doesn't know Jesus or isn't walking with Jesus or right now is far from God, this Sunday would be a great Sunday for you to invite them. I'm going to have a similar kind of evangelistic appeal in the Christmas Eve uh, sermons, so I'll, I'll do that again there. But if they would come to church with you this Sunday, I would encourage you to invite them because I'm going to do my very best to lay forth the gospel in the most simple, honest way and call them to respond. Call them to do the work of preparing Him room in their hearts. And so I just want to encourage you, if, if there's anybody that's on your mind, or your prayer list, uh, in your family, that you've been praying for, uh, this would be a great Sunday to invite them to church. Let me pray for us, and then we will get out of here. <clears throat> Father, I thank you so much for these brothers and sisters. Uh, Lord, we thank you for Jesus who brought us this great salvation, for the fact that he has done everything necessary to save us, and that you are committed to doing everything necessary to conform us into the image of Christ. Uh, God, help us to do our part to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Help us to look for you in the places where we know that you are sure to be found. God, we desire to be like Jesus. Help us to desire Jesus more than we desire our sin. And help us to look at those who are right now lost in darkness with compassion and give us the boldness to seek to reach the lost. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.